Okay, let's get started. Hello. So, so hi everybody, thanks for coming today. Uh, it's been a pretty busy week. Uh, so to, this week we announced ContainerD and today we're going to tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, Solomon, do you want to start? Sure, hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, so some of you might have followed the, the announcement a couple days ago. So we, we announced a new project and we got a lot of questions and interest. And so um, we thought doing a live presentation and discussion about it would be, would be interesting. So what we're going to do is walk through the, what this new project is, why we worked on it, um, what it means for Docker users, Docker customers, the broader container ecosystem, and then at some point we'll do a Q&A, right? And both here live and with anyone watching online, and hopefully answer whatever questions you have. So I'll give a quick high-level summary, and then Patrick will do a much better job at talking about uh, the details. So the short version is that uh, Docker is spinning out uh, a component of our platform, right? And that component is the, what we call the container runtime. So if you think of the Docker platform as an integration of many different components, and together that integration gives you a platform, right? It gives you everything you need to develop applications, build them, deploy them, uh, manage them. One piece of feedback we got uh, pretty consistently from the community was as, as we add new features to that platform, as we solve more problems for our developers and operators, uh, we should be careful to, to make the platform modular. And so what we do is over time, we're perpetually kind of refactoring the codes and looking for opportunities to extract components in a modular way. So the idea is if you're a developer, you, want, you just want to build your application, you install Docker and you get, you get to work. If you're an advanced operator, uh, if you're a platform builder, uh, or if you're just you're tinkering and you want to really get to the bottom of container tech, then you want to pop the hood and you want to tinker with the pieces and assemble, and assemble them maybe in different ways. And so uh, this core container runtime is one of the components that you can now play with and integrate with directly uh, either if you have an, either to improve or customize your existing Docker installation or assemble your own container platform completely separately from Docker. Um, so that's the, that's the high level. That container runtime is called ContainerD. And we'll talk about what it does, how it plugs into the other pieces, what its roadmap is, et cetera, et cetera. So unless there's a, actually, I'm hesitating to take questions now. <laughs> That might be opening the floodgates. Any, any questions right off the bat? We'll have a chance to, to get back to questions later. All right, let's keep going. So Patrick did a lot more work on this than I did. Oh, and, and I forgot to mention the, the rest of the core team that worked on this is uh, sitting in the room. And so every, everyone will come out in the end. And so you'll be able to ask very technical questions also. So all right. OK. Thank you, Solomon. What is ContainerD and how does it relate to Docker? So Docker uh, grew a lot in the past three years. We've been innovating at all levels of the stack. What you can see here is uh, uh, what, it, what it grew to become. So Docker is a full platform to build, ship, and run applications. Uh, in that context, it covers a lot of ground. So it starts with infrastructure, with InfraKit that we um, uh, that we announced at, um, uh, at LinuxCon uh, back in October. So that's a component we open source that uh, takes care of uh, managing your infrastructure. Uh, this is a component that will be at the base of Docker for AWS and Docker for Azure, um, the, our cloud editions. On top of that, you have ContainerD, which is the core container runtime. On top of it, you have SwarmKit, which is our orchestration component that we open sourced uh, at, um, at DockerCon last summer. Uh, and then on top of that, you have all the Docker differentiators, the, the services from the Docker platform that you're using to build, ship, and run your applications. So here are things from the Docker command line client uh, to the Docker API, Docker Compose, authentication, Docker Content Trust, and then uh, a whole uh, uh, ecosystem of plugins for storage and networking. And then on top of that, we build our commercial offerings, which is a, a Docker data center that you can use uh, uh, internally uh, within your company to just manage the whole uh, software lifecycle uh, 
uh, of your company. So ContainerD, what is a core container runtime? ContainerD is a project that already exists. It's been used uh, since Docker 1.11 to provide execution uh, services for, uh, it's the component within Docker 1.11 that executes the containers. Uh, what we're announcing is a roadmap and a new API uh, for ContainerD to provide uh, all the features that you see in the middle here. So container execution and supervision, as well as uh, image distribution, network interface management, uh, local storage, and uh, a low-level plumbing API, that's a gRPC API. Uh, that higher level systems can use to embed ContainerD uh, uh, within them. So Docker is going to use ContainerD as its core runtime, uh, and uh, other projects like Kubernetes or Mesos can do the same. So why did we create ContainerD? Why now? Uh, we receive lots of questions about that. Uh, what you can see here is the is the success of Docker over the past four years, uh, over the past three years. So what you can see here in terms of a uh, number of pools in the uh, uh, Docker Hub, it started with one million in 2014, and uh, we felt very lucky. Uh, but then within one year, it went to one billion, and now we're at eight billion pools. Along the way, uh, along that uh, uh, success curve. Uh, at Docker, we're always focused on uh, creating an, a great experience for end users, both developers and operations. Uh, so for these end users, you can see on the, on the right here in yellow, all the Docker releases, and then while we're doing that on the left side, you can see all the components that we open sourced along the way. So we're continually uh, trying to extract low-level plumbing components as we build our platform with a very polished experience for end users. So it started with things like libcontainer, uh, then when we did uh, Docker Content Trust in 1.8, we had Notary and RunC, which is the OCI reference implementation. Uh, last summer, we released SwarmKit, and ContainerD is just the latest of these plumbing components that we're extracting. So in that way, Docker is pretty similar to the uh, uh, consumer companies like Facebook or uh, Apple, Google, or Netflix, who are focusing on end users first, and then uh, are spinning out open source components that the rest of the industry can uh, use to, uh, uh, to build their own solutions. So the role of ContainerD in the, in the whole container ecosystem can be seen like that here. Uh, at the bottom, you have all the operating systems. So Linux, Windows, uh, Mac, Solaris, and SmartOS. Each of these operating systems have isolation primitives uh, within them that, uh, that then ContainerD will leverage uh, in order to be able to create uh, containers uh, out of that. The OCI, uh, the Open Container Initiative, is the standard in that area that specifies uh, both the image format and the runtime specification uh, for, uh, for ContainerD. So ContainerD will adopt OCI uh, through RunC. Uh, and then, so ContainerD is the common layer that you're, the core container runtime that you're using to pull images and run containers on any of these operating systems. And then on top of that, people can build uh, differentiation and higher level systems. So on the Docker side, we have Docker, which is based on SwarmKit for orchestration. Uh, Amazon has ECS, and they have a whole proprietary stack uh, that will be able to uh, leverage ContainerD. Uh, Microsoft ACS uh, is using Kubernetes, DCOS, or Swarm. They give you a choice of uh, orchestrator. Uh, then you have Kubernetes itself with uh, different uh, flavors. There's OpenShift by Red Hat, and then you have a Google Container Engine who have their own hosted service. Uh, DCOS on top of Mesos, and then you have the Cloud Foundry ecosystem, which today is using RunC, uh, but they still have some code uh, within there uh, that pulls containers and uh, pulls containers images and create the file the, the file system for containers to run. Uh, so they'll be able to leverage Container D directly. Uh, and so Bluemix containers uh, by IBM is based on Cloud Foundry and Pivotal Cloud Foundry uh, as well. 
So the benefit uh, of uh, ContainerD to infrastructure operators, it just allows us to have the boring infrastructure that many people have been asking in the container ecosystem uh, that is stable. So that's the component that uh, everybody can agree on uh, that is stable, that will have a, a LTS policy that's comparable to other infrastructure projects of a, a similar maturity. Uh, and it's uh, a commitment to a stable API. So ContainerD will be the stable uh, component that people can build their system on top and can start innovating on top of that. Uh, it's, it will be a collaborative, uh, community-driven project. So we, uh, uh, so we uh, we're going to donate it in Q1 2017 uh, to a foundation. We're talking to several foundations about that right now. Uh, and it will be branded separately uh, uh, from Docker. And it's a component that's really designed, it's a low-level component that's designed to be embedded. So if you're using Docker today, as a user, it won't change anything for you. You'll just use the Docker command line, the Docker API, uh, and that low-level component, it's just a refactoring inside of Docker. So the benefit to an user is that uh, it avoids fragmentation in the container ecosystem. So when you're using Docker uh, to create images and create uh, multi-container applications, uh, you'll be able to run them on a lot more different platforms. The underlying component that is running container will always be the same. Uh, and so it allows that multi-cloud portability that people are really craving for uh, while allowing Docker to continue to innovate at a high speed on top of a component that is uh, uh, much more stable and evolving uh, more slowly. So you can find the project at uh, github.com uh, slash docker slash containerd. Uh, the interesting aspect that, that were added to the repository on uh, Wednesday are uh, an architecture document that explains the ContainerD architecture. I'll go a little bit over that. Uh, there's a new API in terms of uh, protocol buffer definitions. Uh, and then the uh, roadmap in uh, four phases from how we go from ContainerD 0 to 4 that just does container execution today uh, to ContainerD 1.0 in Q2 2017 that encompasses uh, all the scope that we talked about. So ContainerD is using, is leveraging RunC uh, to run containers. Uh, so RunC is the reference implementation of the Open Container Initiative specification for the runtime. And essentially RunC is a command that lets you, that takes a root file system uh, and a JSON file that defines uh, the isolation characteristics of a container. Uh, and RunC taking these two elements create what is called a container. Now, how does ContainerD leverage his run C? So ContainerD is a daemon uh, that exposes a gRPC API uh, that you can call through a command line called CTR. So CTR is not, uh, uh, is not really a human consumable uh, command line. It's really designed for testing the system and playing with it. ContainerD is really a component that you want to embed into a high-level system but CTR exposes all the gRPC API in a command line. Uh, so you can see the, the, um, the API calls that have been defined in the container service and execution service uh, as of today. Uh, then ContainerD will let you pull images from a registry by URL, so it's a low-level registry interface. It won't talk to the high-level registry where you specify, for example, a name of an image. Uh, ContainerD is at a lower level where you just specify your URL to pull the image from. Uh, and then it will create a root file system and a container.json and then call runc to run uh, containers. So ContainerD today at version in Docker 1.12 ContainerD 0 to 4, the current latest release of ContainerD, uh, is just used to execute containers through RunC. Uh, so that's ContainerD today. And what you can see there is all the other components that form the, the whole Docker platform. ContainerD 1.0, the target architecture, looks something like that, where you'll have a gRPC API. 
Uh, and then also a new metrics API that's following uh, uh, the Prometheus, uh, st uh, the standard defined by Prometheus. Uh, so the Prometheus team was part of the uh, distributed system summit that we organized in Berlin uh, back in October. The two teams started uh, collaborating together and, and that new metrics API will be the result of that. So we want to have a very close integration between Prometheus and Docker and that will happen at the container D level. Then you have different subsystems. The runtime subsystem, which is the only one today, uh, and then there will be a distribution and bundle subsystems uh, that takes care of uh, pulling images and creating the container bundles. And then you have lower level components under that, the executor and supervisor, uh, who take care of executing components with RunC and supervising the processes that have been created that way. Uh, and then a set of components for managing distributions, so content, compo uh, content component, metadata, and snapshots. And that's Container D, uh, uh, container D 1.0 that's targeted to be finished by uh, Q2 2017. And so the new architecture looks something like that. You can see that some of the components have been uh, split into two, a higher level like system storage, system distribution, and system networking. An example of that would be for networking, when you're doing networking in, in, in a swarm cluster, uh, you want to do multi-host networking, uh, and you need a component that, uh, that, that talks to a distributed system to, to keep a state at the cluster level. Container D is really focused more on uh, uh, managing the local network interface on one container on one machine. So you have the higher level system and the lower level system who manages things at uh, uh, the level of one single machine. Uh, so here you have the network interface management, host distribution and host storage uh, that are brought inside of container D. Uh, and then all the other subsystems are, are, are staying into, uh, into Docker itself. So that's, uh, that summarizes the overview of the uh, container D architecture, its link with the container e ecosystem and with Docker. Uh, and now I'll ask uh, the whole team who built that to uh, come on stage and we'll just take questions first from the room and then uh, uh, from uh, uh, online on Twitter if you, you can ask questions with the hashtag container D. All right. <laughs> <laughs> They're busy looking at uh, issues on the Container D GitHub repo. We uh, said when to do the QA. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Feels like we're doing an interview a little bit. <laughs> so, so any questions from the room here? Like Ben, for example, you're going to use Container D within uh, within Vic to implement Vic, the the, the VMware uh, implementation of the Docker API. So, do you, do you ha have you thought about this yet, or have you looked into it, or do you, do you have any questions for the team? Uh, thanks for putting me on the spot, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, you know, I. We, we've been focusing the whole of last year on uh, the plumbing, right? The, you know, the boring stuff, which is exactly where container D is focused, right? And, um, you know, and, and dealing with storage and networking and compute and figuring out how to manage tenancy is, is, the, is the absolute core of that. Um, and things like build and clustering and all these other facets are things which, you know, quite obviously belong above that. And so it's, 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 it's this is, we're so on board with this because it absolutely fits with what our goals were for, for Vic. Uh, for me, I think the really interesting thing about this project is going to be um, um, seeing Container D as much as a compatibility API, right, as a compatibility layer, um, as it is, you know, an implementation, right? Because for us, having uh, ESX sit underneath, I'd really want to get ESX onto your slide <laughs> at some point, because you know that'll be a, that'll be a real result. Um, and 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 our goal has always been to reuse as much common code as possible, right, for compatibility and for use and, you know, we're all in open source, that's all great. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fully on board with this, really excited about it. Great. Any other questions in the room? So in 
terms of the VX land support, um, how was how did you decide to exclude that? You obviously had a summit. You've made some decisions. Uh, VX land is pretty critical in terms of you know dividing and having isolation on the network side, and yet it's sort of outside of the ecosystem. What what's what was behind that decision? <laughs> Uh, I think the general thing is there's still VF interfaces underneath and then the encapsulation is handled at a higher layer. And so that was the reason around it. Like the differences like Mac VLAN and stuff, we want to focus more on the interface side. Like we'll do the Netlink calls for you or we'll get you your interfaces. We could place them inside the containers, but then things like VXLAN, that's, a lot of that's happening above it. And that's the only reason, is just, just that split. Any other questions in the room? Oh, yes, here. Um, is there any provision in the roadmap to have Container D launch Run C as an unprivileged user so that the uh, container itself is unprivileged and adds an extra layer of security? Can you repeat the question with uh, like closer to the, to the mic? I, I, uh, I, was, uh, yeah. uh, I was asking if <laughs> Uh, there is any provision in the roadmap for Container D to be able to launch Run C as an unprivileged user, uh, so we can have an extra layer of security on the containers. So there's no chance of them breaking out. Okay. So the the question is: uh, w Is it on the roadmap to let Container D uh, run Run C as an unprivileged user? Michael, do you want to take this one? Yeah. So like user namespaces are fully Im implemented in Run C now. There's still some changes that we have to do on the Run C side for you to be able to launch it as an unprivileged process, but we have the support today to launch the containers process as unprivileged running in a user namespace. So we're still working on that. We, we got a lot of console work done, which was a big part of it because today we're creating PTYs on the host and providing them to the container and now we do that all internally to the container So that was kind of step one to allow this and Step two is getting these additional fixes in run C before we can do that and in container D we're thinking a lot more about Privilege separation so things like pool Steven could talk more about that, but the processes that actually pull down tarballs from registries for images we're trying to have those run as unprivileged processes. And if they do have to be unpacked as root, then that would be a separate process. And so we're taking the opportunity as we refactor things and split things up to really look at the boundaries of where privileges lie in the system. Uh, another really simple question. Um, the, uh, are you making a commitment to gRPC and protobuf going forward for your other APIs? Or will you remain with the sort of the JSON flavor that you have now? The, the, the question was for uh, across the Docker platform, yeah, all the components. All platforms opposed to just containers So to be honest, it's, it's, it's um, an engineering driven thing, so each component is given a lot of flexibility on what the, what the maintainers want to adopt. I think there's a lot of, I mean, my observation is that um, these days a lot of components seem to really benefit from a nice lightweight binary format, but personally I don't expect JSON to go away either. Um, we, we, the point is we don't have a top-down platform-wide mandate. Um, there's a lot of flexibility for each component to, um, to pick the right tool for the right job.
Yeah, so, um, <laughs> uh, so, the, so um, based, like API selection is really going to be based on the audience, um, the consumer of the API. Um, the, wide, the more widely consumed APIs are going to be in HTTP plus JSON, and so that's like the classic Docker API, just because just that's easier to integrate across languages. Right now, JSON is pretty much the lingua franca. For uh, APIs that, are, that have a narrow set of consumers, um, like internally, um, so Containerd is a great example of that, uh, and also SwarmKit, um, those we've been using gRPC just because of the um, the like iteration value. It lets us kind of uh, focus on the calls and data structures rather rather than the serialization and and HTTP error codes. So um, the, that's that's kind of the lightweight answer. Thank you. So I have a question about image resolution. Um, it seemed like that's built into Containerd and not a separate component. Can you talk a little bit about that that piece, whether it's going to be broken out, whether it's going to be integrated? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first word. The image resolution piece, right? Oh, ima the, the, image res the, okay. the, the piece that pull, pulls and pushes images. And yeah. So, so this the, the line here has always been a uh, a tough one to draw in the Docker daemon, and part of this project is. Um, taking the last two or three years of experience and trying to cut that line out in, in the right spot. Um, the, so so the, the, the classic line um, where we've always seen um, the largest piece of integration is between um, layers and graph drivers and pulling images. And I think we have a good line drawn there. And, and there's a snapshot proposal in a, another document called the dataflow.md, which kind of shows these examples. Um, on the resolution side, uh, we're still trying to figure out uh, what the actual interface is. It'll likely be um, some sort of opaque naming system along with a, a location and, and possibly, um, uh, th there's a couple of examples uh, that we're working on that, that can, um, where, where we, we're actually showing how different tools can be used to actually resol uh, resolve these images. But the actual unpacking um, and uh, bundle creation is done through, um, a, uh, a content addressable uh, addressable interface, which should decouple like pull from the actual um, the actual creation of the uh, containers. So uh, naming and resolution should be a lot more flexible in the future with Containerd. Just one thing I want to add on this is um, um, Containerd will be much less opinionated opinionated about how it does name resolution. So, for example, the short name resolution that we have today in Docker, such as Ubuntu results to Docker.com, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, will will not exist in Containerd, of course. And an important point in all this is, if you're using Docker today, none of this impacts your experience in using Docker, right? So, um, when we're saying Container D has a facility for pulling images and naming them, and that facility will not be tied to uh, Docker-specific collections of images. The way Docker pull something will give you our version of that something. Um, that just means you have more options to build different kinds of systems in a very open way. Docker will continue to build uh, a platform that out of the box points you to um, our curated collection of images because there's a lot of demand for that, right? So it's just different, different solutions for different audiences, right? If you want absolute flexibility, that comes at a cost. You have to build everything else around it. Uh, so bo bottom line, Containerd is interesting if you want to build everything else yourself. Uh, if, if that's not your thing, then probably you won't even need to know what container D is or how it works. Okay, given that uh, you've got uh, right now the upgrade path or bug fix path, whatever you want to call it, is a single monolithic upgrade, the entire thing. Is there ever any intent of actually breaking these components out to where I can get an update or a bug fix to container D without changing everything in the operation. Yes, that's, that's, that's one benefit that under the hood, even if you do deploy the whole Docker platform, under the hood it is modular, it is made of different daemons and command line tools, et cetera. So if you want to upgrade one without upgrading the others, you can. Um, 
then of course, with more control means more responsibility. If you're, if you're picking the combination of components, then you're taking responsibility for making sure that combination works. And one of the value adds of Docker is that we, we do a lot of work around integrating a specific selection of those components at a specific version, testing them uh, against each other, against the underlying infrastructure, et cetera. So when you install Docker, you also get that. But the point is now, you're not forced to. It's, it becomes a choice. Patrick and Solomon, if, if there are no more questions in the audience, I have a couple. Well, then we I'll can, read the first we can one. Mix. We can even sure. Um, first question is, are you planning to run Docker without Run C? Sorry. Are you planning to run Docker without Run C? Uh, run C is not a hard re requirement for Docker or Containerd. The important thing about having an OCI spec is that there can be multiple implementations. So Containerd doesn't depend on Run C; it depends on OCI, and so it depends on the config format and the CLI spec that we're working out for Run Run C. So anything that implements this interface works in Containerd without any modification. Cool. Uh, the next question is, will DTR support other container D implementations? What was the first word? Will DTR support other container D implementations? I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, so D DTR is the acronym for Docker Trusted Registry. So it's the enterprise grades, commercially supported image registry that Docker sells. Um, will it support other Containerd versions? I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a guess that it's talking about different version, di different image formats, maybe. And then, oh. yeah, if if the question is talking about supporting different image formats, yes, that's the, I mean that, that's part of the goal. But uh, mostly, uh, the uh, content addressable system defined as part of the Docker distribution project and now in OCI. So. Um, but I don't know if I fully understand that question. I, I mean, one, one possible answer to that is one of the goals of this project is to, is to finalize the creation of a unique standard that everyone can build on top of and move on to innovating at other layers of the stack. And so right now, there's a little bit of fragmentation. There's different formats if you want to run um, containers. But all these formats are extremely close. And a year ago, we created this uh, group called OCI to define a spec. And although it took a year to really finalize that effort, it, I think it's really close now. And so um, really, I think one answer is with Containerd as the, the main implementation and OCI as the standard, I think we're going to see everybody adopting OCI as the, the individual container format. Um, and DTR will, of course, adopt that format too. So nice. Yeah, I, I didn't have any more information to go off on that one, but I think you guys did a nice job. Uh, the next question reads: What major changes are on the roadmap for SwarmKit to run on Containerd, if any? Um, so Docker Engine today already builds on top of Containerd specifically for the container execution piece. So technically, if you're using SwarmKit, you're already running your containers with Containerd. Um, as Containerd will grow in scope, we're going to have more and more features of the engine be ported to Containerd. Um, and naturally, SwarmKit being the orchestrator will consume more of Containerd features over time. Nice. Um, the next one I have for you guys. Would you mind sharing why you went with gRPC for the API? Uh, so I briefly touched on this earlier, but the, uh, the big reason is iteration speed. Um, we can really focus on RPC calls and the data structures rather than 
uh, focusing on how things are serialized in JSON, um, as well as HTTP error codes. And I know this sounds ridiculous, but uh, a lot of time is wasted on that, because getting them right is extremely important. Um, and I think uh, you know, many of my colleagues can lament with this situation. So um, you know, despite your opinions about gRPC, um, you know, we, we, we've found it to be a, a huge multiplier in our, in our like, feature velocity. Um, at the same time, there, there are definitely cases for where HTTP JSON APIs, I mean, they're so easy to use, it's human readable, you can debug it, there's great tools for it. So um, if we do find those use, where, where those use cases make sense for Containerd, we, we, we might uh, go that way, but for now, it's going to be purely a gRPC API. Oh, except for metrics, yeah. So, so metrics is a is a um, uh, w so we're using the Prometheus format, which is uh, defined over HTTP, but that's standards track into the CNCF, or it might be already standardized. So, uh, we don't need to do any work there. So, it's the same kind of uh, like multipli multiplicative effect on our velocity. Like, we don't have to do much thinking; we just kind of use it, and it works. And and that's that's the main goal. Yeah, and I, I again, I, I would not interpret. Containerd using gRPC as a sign that Docker as a whole is abandoning abandoning anything else and going towards gRPC everywhere. Um, in other words, if you're using an existing Docker API and it's not gRPC based, don't panic. We're not going to break that interface. Nice. Um, next question reads: How do you expect to see others leverage Containerd outside of Docker? Uh, yeah, so ha the question how, right? How? Yes. Um, so, I mean, high level answer there's a lot of products and platforms out there that rely on the ability to run containers. And the whole point of Containerd is to make that really easy. It's very embeddable, the API is very low level. So, I think the how is simply by um, adopting. Calling the Containerd API, um, and then either bundling Containerd in the versions of their platforms, or um, having a requirement that Containerd be installed. I, I mean, that's the short version. I think a lot of uh, there's already work in some of these platforms to adopt Run C. Um, so I think adopting Containerd is an extension of adopting Run C. Right? You're already you already have one foot in the door if you're using Run C. And then in terms of, of how, um, so Containerd is, is, is a lower level API, it's also a more um, well separated API, I would say. So you don't have to take it, you don't have to take all of Containerd at once. You can use Containerd for image distribution, you can use Containerd for container execution. Um, you, can, you, can, you can cherry pick what you need from Containerd and build the rest on top. So I think there is a, there is a huge opportunity for different platforms who have, which have different needs to take in as much as they need from Containerd and, uh, and and specify the rest as they see fit. So their own networking stack, their own way of distributing images. We'll, we'll see how we'll see how it goes, but I, I I think there's a lot of possible use cases for this. And, and by the way, I, th I think at least at the beginning, by far the dominant use of Containerd uh, is going to be through installing Docker. And then um, looking at the internals and, and customizing, right? So maybe you want to add an extra hook, or you want to troubleshoot your Docker installation by hitting the Containerd API directly, right? And so over time, I think we're going to see a lot of um, highly customized Docker installations, um, thanks to this new Containerd interface. Um, and then separately, we're going to see new new platforms either in-house platforms or commercial platforms built from scratch around Containerd, but that's, that's going to take longer, right? Sounds like cool stuff. Um, the last question I have for you guys. How did you guys, how did you decide which features should get into Containerd, and how did you come up with a scope for, or, or, of the future containers? I can try to give a short answer on this one, but I think everybody will have a take on this. Um, I think the rule of thumb is: can we can we figure out the scope that will that we can agree on 
for 80% of the consumer. If something is just not well decided enough, not mature enough, that there is no obvious agreement on the way it should be done, then maybe container D is not the right place or not the right place yet. Um, so I, th I, think, I think that's one. Um, another one is things that can typically be more naturally built on top should be built on top. I don't know if any, uh, any of you want to expand on this. That's I agree, but... Uh <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it th think of it as the equivalent of the Linux kernel um, in the OS world. So, you know, putting something in the kernel has a cost. So the general approach is what, what you put in the kernel is what cannot be done better uh, higher. So uh, the kernel is as exact, it should be exactly as large as is needed and, and no larger. Um, and so the, the way we find that line, honestly, has been by talking to a lot of people who have been asking us for this component, right? There's a lot of, you know, at the orchestration layer, for example, Patrick showed the, this diagram. You've got Mesos, you've got Kubernetes, you've got ECS, you've got Cloud Foundry, you've got Nomad. There's a whole bunch of orchestrators, Box now. Um, and if you're building your own orchestration system, um, then you want to benefit from certain features of the Docker platform, those that can run containers, but you don't want to use the parts that uh, Docker includes, which is a built-in orchestration with SwarmKit. So that's been a big request for those who are already building their own orchestration. Um, and right now, the, what they do is they install all of Docker, and they basically don't use a whole bunch of, of stuff, and then they hit the rest. Um, so Containerd really is, it's everything that a, a third-party orchestrator might want from Docker uh, and nothing else, roughly. So the question is about cross-platform nature of uh, Containerd. I see that you are uh, you have drawn out here Linux, Windows, Mac, Solaris, Smart OS. These are not native containers on the Mac, Solaris, and so Smart OS ones, right? <laughs> Can take this one. Okay. Containers were born on Solaris and BSD. <laughs> so. What I mean by that is question. that there are isolation primitives in these OSs uh, that could enable people to build a run C OCI implementation running on these operating systems, and thus Containerd could run on them. So while today the focus on Containerd is on uh, Linux and Windows, uh, we expect that over time it will run on any operating system that has the isolation primitives needed uh, to run containers. Okay, so TBD future. Yeah, the key, the key is really OCI. If, if, your system <coughs> if your system has an OCI implementation, then Containerd can leverage that. And th this diagram, it's, half of it is to show what's possible, and half of it is to show the commit, our commitment, which is that we'll, wherever it makes sense for OCI containers to be run, Containerd will follow. Uh, sorry, to continue the same question, uh, to touch on the um, not run C stuff. If can be using some like joint, joint implementation of uh, and smart yes. container stuff. No, but we're writing something like container like thing in smart OS. I'm talking about joint. Do you know if I want to have plans to implement run C? So container D will try to adopt something outside run C and run what joint has now. Yeah. So, if I understand correctly the question, I think the answer is what Michael mentioned earlier, which is that the hard requirement for container D is only the OCI interface. So 
think of it as Containerd by itself doesn't actually create containers. Containerd by itself will only uh, call into the OCI compliant binary that will be capable of creating a sandbox to run a process inside. So whether that, that implementation is run C, the default one that we use for Linux containers, or something entirely different, doesn't really matter to Continuity. Um, for example, uh, on, on Solaris, there's work in progress on an implementation, an implementation called RunZ, which actually leverages Solaris zones uh, through an OCI compliant yeah. binary. And in this case, Continuity, for Continuity, it doesn't change anything, really. Oh, I see. I guess was, my question was like, just, or oh, Containerd support something not OCI compliant, or it just whatever salary zones will go OCI compliant? Yeah, yeah so exactly. So the, 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 um, the example of salary zones is they, they adapted the OCI runtime spec and are trying to make a compliant implementation based on zones. Oh. And that should be the contract. I, I don't think there's any plan for Containerd to support anything but the OCI runtime spec um, as the backend. Oh, this is why in that diagram you have OCI as a dotted line because that's the interface oh, I I between, yeah, between container D and the underlying system. Um, since we're talking about OCI, I think one, one question I got um, is which part of OCI we're going to adopt and um, uh, do we do we like OCI? <laughs> and part of the goal, one of the goals of this project is to make it clear that the answer is yes. We we're adopting OCI, we're embracing it, and that includes not just the original limited scope, but the more recently expanded scope. Um, and so, I think it took a while to figure out what's the right scope for OCI, uh, and there's been a lot of technical debates. I've been famously involved in some of them. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think that, that cycle took a year. To be honest, when we introduced OCI, we optimized for speed. You know, we, we felt like the, the priority was to introduce something, demonstrates that we care about standards, and demonstrating that we're listening, because a year ago, the feedback was, hey, you gotta give us a spec, open up the formats, you know, come on, let's go. Um, and so, I think the first version was sort of an MVP. Uh, and a year later, now we have a, um, I'm sure there's still gonna be a little bit of iteration, but I think we have mostly a complete scope now where you can, OCI defines uh, how you run things and how you, but also how you store the thing to run uh, in, a, in a transportable format, in an image. Uh, so now it also makes sense to expand the scope of, of the runtime to adopt that. Yeah, I, I, I hope OCI, I mean, the, the thing with standards is at some point you want it to slow down, right? So we, we're kind of hoping things are going to slow down. I mean, in a way, container D is a way to take one piece, the, the bottom layer of the Docker platform, and start slowing it down. Uh, because what we've heard is that's what users want, especially operators running Docker in production. They're happy that we're innovating at the higher layers of the stack and, and helping developers and obviously more productive. But for the data plane, for the thing that's running their containers in production, they want to see things slowing down. So we're slowing down the implementation gradually by reducing its scope. And we're relying on the fact that the standard OCI is also slowing down even more. Um, and yeah, so. I think the next year is going to be a gradual slowing down of the, the interfaces and features at that layer, but then uh, all of the efforts, the engineering effort, will be focused on the long tail of performance optimizations and edge cases and, and bug fixes, et cetera, like Linux. Uh, going back to OCI, a large part of the usability of OCI depends, as you said, on it being a slow-moving target. Uh, since there are going to be multiple third-party implementations, is there going to be somebody who is going to shepherd the effort to keep it stable? As in, test it against a whole range of uh, APIs that the OCI specifies so that you can say that this 
OCI implementation, the runc that you have, for for example, the runc that Solaris is coming up with, does work well enough for an operator like me to use? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give it a first try, but I think there's there's multiple layers of the effort, right? There is OCI is a standards body, and so you have different participants in the industry working together to define the spec and then um, clarify what are the rules what's compliant, what's not. So that's typical standards body work, and uh, Docker is one of the participants in that. Uh, and I think the process has matured a lot. I think now we're, we're in a good place. So that's the first part, right? OCI will kind of define what's compliant, what's not. And on top of that, you have implementations, and you have testing of these implementations, um, certification of those implementations. And so then different different um, impl implementers will do that differently. What Docker is doing is providing container D as the best possible implementation. And then on top of that, we're integrating container D with other components into a, a product we call Docker, right? And so then we take responsibility for testing that. And a lot of the value we add, we think, is, is telling uh, the end user who needs to deploy a full container platform. All these pieces will work together. We've tested them. It's certified. It's supported. If something goes wrong, you can call us and we can fix it, etc. And other vendors will do the same thing with their products, right? And I think that's the model you want, right? Oh, the, the internet is going easy on us. <laughs> no hard questions. All right, last, last call on tough questions. Is a serious one or no? I will regret saying that. Solomon, I've got a question for you. Container D, or how will Container D integrate with CNI and CNM? That's actually not a question for me. Yeah, so as far as the networking model goes, we're still looking into it. And a lot of people that's worked on both sides, CNM and CNI, are part of the discussion. So at first, the level that we're targeting is close to the CNI level. So the inputs for like creating an interface, setting gateway, setting IPs, things like that is the level that we want to target. So it makes it a really good fit for what we're looking for. And we're also balancing other requests that like CNM is way too high, CNI is very low, and has some issues there. So we're balancing both, seeing like, should we take CNI wholesale or do we need to find a good middle ground with everyone where everyone's happy and like we have something that's useful for the broad user base? And so it's kind of uh, just discussions right now. We have an issue on the repo where we have a lot of people getting involved in the networking discussion. So. So, so one thing to note, uh, uh, kind of going back with the um, in the theme of the gRPC API, is is the API is actually a host local API, and um, so I think in the past we've tried to abstract a lot of things that were either unabstractable, that's a new word, um, <laughs> uh, or or when we or when they are, they do get abstracted, you lose granularity or flexibility across different systems. Um, by you know having an API that can kind of work with the host system, a lot of these um, these issues where hey you know I can't get at this like particular kernel setting or you know I can't configure my interface in the way in, in the way that I need for my application, um, th those kind of uh, th those problems will be uh, become l l uh, less problematic. Uh, so so. Um, and, and just like so, as we're going out, we're saying, "Hey, this GR this this API runs on the same host that is accessing it, and it will kind of um, avoid these issues of where, hey, can I access this local resource or not?" Which you have with the Docker API, and it'll make it a lot clearer um, as far as uh, integration goes.
Well, uh, if there are no other questions. Yeah, we've got a fun one for you. Uh, the internet asks, Solomon, do you have any plans to run for public office? <laughs> Is it because of the tweeting? <laughs> I'm going to attribute it to your charisma, but I don't know. I, I don't know what the internet means. I'm not sure how to answer that question. I guess uh, I'll think of a funny answer. <laughs> and I'll tweet it, of course. She does her own Twitter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> uh, the, I'll just I'll say something about the CNI CNM thing. I I passed on the question because I think it's up, honestly to the maintainers to decide, um, and that's already an answer in itself. The whole point here is to do the right thing technically. Um, back in I think it was 2015. Everything we do is based on what our developers and customers ask. So if you just look at everything we've done in the last three years, you can be sure there's a lot of people behind the scenes just asking us to do it. And then we picked the next most urgent thing to do, and we do that. And so in 2015, one thing we did is we, we made the networking stack in Docker much more powerful and much more modular. And we introduced a plugin system. And when the time came to do that, we needed to define, we needed an interface for, for that modularity layer. And we needed to work with existing networking systems, a lot of which were not created for containers. And at the same time, of course, work with containers. And it turned out at the time there was no such interface. So we had to create it from scratch. And, um, and we, we, we created one called CNM, Container Network Model. Um, and the result of that is a whole ecosystem of network plugins for Docker. And um, that plus an overlay networking implementation and working with the, the socket plane team, the result was out of the box, Docker can now wire up your containers across a whole swarm. And that really, that really solved the problem. Uh, then along the way, other interfaces appeared, including one called CNI. Uh, and CNI and CNM are different, but they're not that different. Why there's two instead of one, as usual in technology, right? There's always a bunch of different options because people have different opinions on how it should be done. Um, had CNI existed when we were looking for options, who knows if we would have used this did or not? Um, it did not exist. So now we're in this situation where there's a whole ecosystem around CNM-based Docker networking plugins, and there's a different ecosystem of CNI-based plugins and um, in a, you know, if there's an opportunity with Containerd to make those things work better together, then obviously we'll do it. The, you know, the, the problems that the maintainers face have to do with not breaking their existing users, right? There's literally millions of people who use Docker, and we don't intend to tell them in a few months, oh, everything that you do, you've done around networking is now broken. Uh, it's going to have to be more gradual than that. Um, but now that Containerd is open and everyone can show up and help, I'm, I'm hoping that everyone works together in finding the solution. So if you're listening to this and you're interested in the topic, my, my recommendation is go to the Containerd repo, participate in the discussions, and ideally contribute code to demonstrate your opinion. And that's how we'll make progress. Well said. Did we go through the questions? All right, last, last call. All right, so we'll, we'll see you on the repo, I guess. All right. Thanks a lot.